So I'm told I'm, I don't need to tell about my historian job that I can go back further. So I'm going to share something that doesn't start in Hammond because I was not born in the town of Hammond or Augensburg where most people <clears throat> were born if they parents were having children back in 1955, and that gives you an age of what I am. Amen. <laughs> so I started out life in, in Massachusetts, and my dad had been in the Army Air Force, and he had actually had a couple of buddies that were from Hammond, one of them being Tuffy Millsap, and the other one being Bob Gibson, who actually lived only two houses over. And Dad was a good hard worker and, and he just, in fact, he did a lot of farming when he was growing up. Um, but he was getting pulled in different directions and he thought, you know what, I want to go out on my own. So he came and he looked at farms in Hammond since he had some buddies up here. Um, it didn't quite work out for Hammond, it did work out for Lisbon. So when I was four years old, we moved up to a farm in Lisbon. and. I just loved the farm. I actually, I would trade chores with my sister and I would do some of her barn chores and she would do some of my house chores and it shows to this day if you come to my house and visit. <laughs> that being said, um, it, the farm life was, was wonderful until one day, um, on August 12th, 1967, we had a um, tragedy on our farm where I lost both my, my dad, who was 43, and my brother, who was 14, in a harvest store, a silo accident. And I won't go into the details of that, but it was a, it was a tough day. Um, my older brother, Steve, who's Hammond, town assessor here, was state FFA president at the time, and he would have been the eldest to help out on the farm, and he was on a train in Canada. And because I just loved the farm, I kind of, I said, who's going to milk the cows? Who's going to do this? You know, so I just, I had to kick into work gear and um, tell the men that we had tons and tons of, of neighbors and people come from all around to help us out. And it was wonderful, and I just told them, you know, which cows were the better milkers or which one the kicked, and, oh, this one gets as much grain and, and what have you. Um, and then my, my brother, instead of going to Cornell that year, decided, well, we'll try to farm. And we did, and it was really tough. And so we decided to sell the cows. Um, and then fast forward into my college years, I uh, went with my sister and a few friends. I was getting over the first love of my life. And my sister said, you ought to come up to, to Alex Bay. There's, a, there's some good old Hammond boys there. <laughs> and, you know, we just like to have fun and dance and what have you. And so I went with them. And in Anchor Lounge, I met my future husband. Oh. He saved me from an old man that was trying to dance with me. So. <laughs> um, so anyway, instead of my becoming a missionary nurse, marrying a missionary doctor, being off in Timbuktu in Africa, my mission was in the little town of Hammond. And we have been very happy farming. I only did nursing for about two and a half years, and then some on the volunteer side, and then nursing my seven children. Um, and then homeschooling and farming. And we have been very blessed as a family, and it's going on to the eighth generation now. Back in 1824, Ebenezer was the one to begin it. So that's my story up until now being historian. So thank you very much. Oh, oh. Da, 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 you gonna, da. It's okay. I have a shotgun mic and it's, it's doing just fine. So I really. You want to leave that? Good. Thank you. Thank you. Hey. We, we actually.
actually have an order to the storytelling tonight. And next up is, I think we're going to hear a little more about dairy farming from Mike Savage. Is that right, Mike? Yeah. Come on up, Mike. Hey, Mike. Thanks. I uh, hope I don't get stage fright up here. <laughs> Actually, I used to be a stand-up comedian, and I cannot deal with crowds anymore. So forget it. <laughs> like it back in the corner. We don't see anybody. We won't have one. We're not here. No tomatoes thrown at me. Um, as Donna said, you know, growing up on the farm and everything, people around in Hammond, really, and anywhere I probably, but Hammond, uh, really stuck together and helped each other out when they were farmers. And if someone, you know, had trouble or was sick or a machine broke down, they were all willing, you know, to come help. And uh, I remember one time my dad was real sick, not real sick, but his back went out and uh, he couldn't do anything. And next thing you know, the neighbors are over there milking the cows and, and whatnot for them. And it's, it's amazing that uh, you don't see that anymore, you know, with, a, with the community. And that's sad. I remember um, a lot of these stories are not things that I was really involved in, per se, but that I remember, you know, dad talking about or my brothers and sisters. Well, uh, with a, a thrashing machine, and if people don't know what a thrashing machine is, is that you take the oats, you know, the straw, whatever, and you separate them in this machine, and, and then the oats go over here, the straw goes here and back out. Well, three or four of my neighbors, I believe, owned one together. They all threw in with my dad, and I think it was the Pitten brothers, and the Rosenbarker brothers, and I think maybe even the Allens were involved with that. So that's an example of how you know, people, you know, work together and, and whatnot. Um, so I got to go down to my notes once in a while here. But uh, yeah, it was a dairy farm on the, on the St. Lawrence. And in the haying part, uh, the worst part about the haying was is how hot and sweaty that you would get up in the hay mouth. And being on the river, it was nice that when the day was over, we could go down to the water and jump in that cold St. Lawrence River. Yeah. And, um, and growing up, growing up uh, haying as kids, one of the, the fun things was with the you know, we had those bales that were shot out of the baler as compared to other ones. And, and they were the short bales, not these big ones you see today. But uh, they'd fill up the hay, hay wagon with that, and we'd ride back to the barn on those hay wagons, uh, like you see the Amish do, but ours was, were in bales. And to get the bales, you know, up into the hay mouth, you know, the barns, you know, we had were the larger style and, you know, instead of the smaller ones, we would uh, ride the elevator up. So that was about the... The funnest part of, of doing the haying, and you, the, the mouth was just so darn hot that the second best part was getting out of there. <laughs> we, we'd use the elevator as a slide. <laughs> that was, um, also, another thing we learned to do in, in the hay mouths was, um, as, as you can see here with the large beams, as the hay started getting bigger, we could walk around these beams. And if you can imagine uh, the taller barns, like you know, that we had around here of getting up to the next level beams, which were probably as high as the, the second ones there. Well, you got kind of cocky as kids and you'd be running back and forth on these beams. Well, as the winter progressed and the hay was being fed to the cows, well, it come down lower and lower and you'd still run on these beams. And then when the hay got down to nothing, we would still run on the beams. <laughs> not, not be scared of it. Luckily, uh, I have two other, uh, two brothers and two sisters uh, older than myself. and. Luckily, none, none of us uh, fell. <laughs> if we did, there was enough hay under that it, it didn't bother us that way. Um, we, we make hay forts. You know, it's always fun. Anybody who had worked with those little style bales, they stacked up like bricks, and you could make um, hay forts out of them and tunnels and whatnot. And, uh, I remember the neighbor kid, we had a bunch of hay in their barn, and we made this uh, huge fort that took up the whole thing. It was uh, Rosenbarker's. Uh, the Rosenbarker brothers were still haying, but Dean Rosenbarker had retired. So the Rosenbarker brothers stored some hay in there one year, and we just overtook it. And we made the whole upper part of the mound one big hay floor. We stole two by fours, and we'd use those so we could use them as you know beams and stuff, and pile more hay on top. We had rooms so we could we could even even stand up in in there. Um, so um, Dad, I remember one year, or I don't remember, but I remember the story that uh, they took in uh, farm cadets, what they called them, uh, fresh air kids, in, you know, from the city. And I, I had a picture I submitted, and um, I should have made a bigger thing. It shows these two two birds there. Uh, gets them out of trouble, I guess, for the city. Uh, 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 uh. During World War II, being a uh, shortage, you know, farm help, a lot of those kids got out of the city and, up, and then helped out with the, you know, just the, the shortage. That uh, The milking, you know, we had the cans, the milk cans about that tall and stuff. But 
that's where the milk went, and then go to the, the milk plant. And, and I do remember, do remember this. Um, us, our farm, along with the neighbors, would one day uh, my dad would load his dark cans on, and the neighbors and whatnot, and then they'd take them to the milk plant. And next time, the other neighbor would do that, and then they'd cycle like that. I don't remember going to the Hammond milk plant, but I do remember going to Governor, and you'd take the, the cans, and they'd put them on these rollers, and gravity would take them in, they'd dump them into the tanks, and then they'd go through washing and sterilizing out the other side. It was just neat as a kid to, to, see, to see that, to go through um, that. Well, another thing I had to do with milking, I had to deal with the milk inspectors for the milk plant. Mm -hmm. and, and I heard a couple stories. The one was that my dad, uh, with the, um, got kicked out of the milk plant for some violation, and they took the, they took the milk and dumped it into another guy's bulk tank and sold the milk as compared, you know, through them. You know, so the guy goes, where'd you get all the extra milk, that he said. And he goes, well, you know, uh, some cows, um, tractor trailer uh, broke down, and they, the cows, we took them in here, we milked them, and that's what it was. The other one was, uh, there was a violation of having the manure too close to the barn, and they had to have a fence around it. So my dad went out there, and they just put a bunch of posts in the ground, didn't even put wires around it. But I, I got off on the hand too much, but my dad, not just uh, on the farm, he did other things. Uh, he ran uh, down, to, down to Mexico, New York, and got apples. And he would bring the apples up and split them up, and he'd drive around, you know, peddling them and through the years. And one quick story on that, my dad told me to stay in the truck. I was about three. Well, I didn't. I said, the reason he wanted me to stay in the truck is there was an open cesspool right there, and I was stepped right on <laughs> into it. And um, the other thing Dad did is uh, they also had a trash route around Oak Point and Chippewa Bay and, and whatnot. And as a kid, amazing the stuff that people, people threw away. So my dad did a lot of other things besides just farming to make a living and, and working up here. When he retired, they had a paper route, too, that, at the Watertown Times, and they brought um, the... Is that for me to stop? <laughs> okay, because I got one last story. They, they had the paper route. On the trash can uh, route, whatever, they would pick up pot cans back in the 80s, and Dad would take them in for the nickels. And so when they had the, the mail run, or, or paper run, when they'd go around with the uh, Watertown Times and the things, they'd also pick up their uh, cans. But they had this, this uh, uh, grasping, kind of like what the older people don't pull their socks on, and they put the paper on that in the, in the blue tubes there if the snow banks were too big. Well, one day, uh, my mom and dad, a friend would told me the story. He said, come along, there's Bill and Mary. Their um, cars broke down the side of the road. They thought they broke down. So they start to pull up, and all of a sudden, the door opened, and out come this stick, and it grabbed the pop can. <laughs> <laughs> so they, they would pick them up on, on that route as well. So they were going after that. Fun. They'd get out of the car, nothing, just a stick came out. <laughs> All right, uh, that's, that's my part on this. It's really neat to hear your stories about being a kid on a farm and mowing away hay. I think so. Um, this is all by way of uh, introducing you to our next tellers, who, um, from my little bit of conversation with them before we got started, I think have a few stories of their own to tell, and they are going to tell something. I'm not sure what. <laughs> they are the Varnway brothers, and they come from this neck of the woods. They all live somewhere in northern New York still. And I'm going to bring them all up here now and let them introduce themselves to you. So, guys, where are you? Did you leave? Did you leave? All right. So if you want to hold this, then you can pass around. Okay. And introduce yourself, because I don't know each of your names. All right. I'm Phil. I'm Lee. I'm Greg. We're done. No. <laughs> Actually, uh, we're very close to where we were brought up. It was that house right behind Demarn over there. Oh, right over there. Yeah, we were just over there walking around looking at it. Still there, but it's not what I remember. I don't remember it. I'm too young. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we're just talking about uh, uh, the Lombardway family in general, I think. That had a, quite an impact on our little village here. My, our grandfather moved here in 1914, I want to say. 13? And he came into town as a barber, and starting a barber business. He 
actually bought the barbershop downtown. He was 18 years old when he bought it, and this was in 1914, something like that. So he learned how to cut hair at a very young age, I think 11. But you didn't have to go to school back then. I know all this because I did a bibliography on him. My brothers didn't, so I just read that thing before I came here. Uh, but we have a, a large history of uh, barbering in our family, so I'll just pass this over to my brother here, Greg, and you can add on. Uh, yeah, I believe it's over 100 years of barbering of some kind in the family. I think my older brother over here was, I think, the last of the LeVarn Wave barbers. He did it for 47 years. And it was a grandfather, uncle, my mother was a beautician, my aunt was a beautician in Hammond, so that's why our hair looks so good all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and, still got it. Yeah, we still got hair, I don't know what they did. Oh, yeah. but, but that's kind of, you know, the, the basis of the story here. And there's other things to add to it, which I think Lee over here can throw in some other things that they did, as well as barbering. Well. Yeah, my, uh, you mean like that real barbing in the, in the oh, sure, sure. Sure. shop, and uh, my mother was a beautician, and, uh, but I remember back uh, the old barber shop where it burned down, I was like five, six years old, I'd go in there when I could, some great stories, great memories there, uh, just all the people, it was a busy place, so they had uh, just a pool room and barber shop then, but later when after that burned, they had the bowling alley and the and the barbershop and the pool room, and uh, it was busy early in the morning till late at night, every day, seven days a week, just about. And uh, well, when I was five years old, they took me back to the pool table and pulled my first tooth that was loose, I think it was. And, and it just went on from there, just many stories. And I don't know, there were, uh, one, well, one of the things, the older barbershop, when I was going to school on my job, uh, after basketball practice or anything like that, before the bowling, when they had bowling down there, we'd have to go down, clean the shop, get the bowling alleys ready, get the, uh, you know, just sweep the floor, get the Pepsi cooler filled. Uh, Can you hold your microphone a little cool. closer? Oh, there it is. Well, okay. And uh, <laughs> one of the things also I had to do was weekends, every Saturday I'd go down there and really clean the place, go clean the pits and all this, and one of the jobs I had was burning all the hair that they collected during the week. The burning barrel out on the side. And uh, that was quite a chore. I think you did it too, didn't you, Phil, or not? When you were I burned things when I did burn 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 hair. hair. <laughs> and uh, it's a hard thing to keep hair burning, I'll tell you. That means stick, keep stirring it. Anyway, a lot of good memories there. Yeah, a lot of fun. <laughs> I had to tell a story. My uncle Bernie, he was kind of a character. He'd drive down there in his big Cadillac, and he always had a Cadillac. I don't know why, but he did. And when he'd go home, he'd live up out in the hill there. He'd do a big U-turn, never stop, never check the stop traffic. He'd just go down and turn by the old post house there and head up the hill about zero to 60 in five seconds to get up there. But my, I listened to him talk about the barbershop. Now, we grew up, we got a lot of our education sitting in the barbershop when we were kids because all the World War II guys were back and it was a collection point after everybody dumped their milk off at the milk plant, Mike. All the milk trucks came in there in the winter time and they had to burn time so they played pool. So all, you know, they did uh, all kinds of nasty things to each other. My grandfather had a, he had a wire under the, where he cut hair. And on the pool hall he had one of the chairs hot wired back there, you know, big captain <laughs> chairs. And, Oh my God, they get going back there and the smoke, you couldn't even see the pool balls hardly because of the, you know, da da da. And he'd hit that button and some guy would fly up about four feet and out the door he'd go and go home. And, you know, and then, then my uncle said one time, uh, Did you hear about your grandfather, what he did one day? I said, No, what, what, what happened, Uncle Marie? He said, Well, this guy came in and he was always kind of an agitator to my grandfather. And he sat on the, the bench, they had a nice kind of a metal bench there. And he had a nice big old red apple, it was in the fall. And my grandfather was cutting the gentleman's hair. And he said uh, to my grandfather, I bet you'd like a bite out of that apple, wouldn't you, Roy? He said, well, you know, I would, yeah, I would. He says, well, I don't think you can get it. I'll take a bite out of that apple. He said, well, I, I would if I want to. 
I said, well, I don't think you could. Well, anyway, they met, kind of left the guy in the chair. The guy was sitting there getting his hair cut. Left the guy in the chair. They got in a little rumble, went through the screen door on the sidewalk on the main street, rolled around. Grandpa got it, took, took a bite of the apple, threw it down, and said, there. They went back in and cut the guy's hair. <laughs> so, but uh, a lot of stories uh, generated there. I, you're giving us a sign there, so we got to wrap this up. Oh, a halfway sign. Uh, oh, okay. That's what that means. Okay. Uh, I have to tell a story too about going to school. And after school, my uncle was a, was a bowling alley. He had a lot of times he had leagues set up for the kids. So the minute the buzzer went off at the school to get out, you could see about thirty kids running down the hill to get to the bowling alley to do their bowling. And then we'd have the, the pool room. And it was just a, a community center more than it was anything, you know. And they also, we didn't tell them this, but they, they also had a shoe store at one time above the, that was my father that did that. No, right there. Or below. Yeah. See, they're older, they know more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, <laughs> this is what they tell me. They must have screwed have up. An interesting right down here. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know anything about it, you know, but... It was just a, it was just a great place to uh, be brought up, and, and our families were very close, so we always were together and stuff. And, and Hammond was very close, and it was just just a great place to be brought up with all a lot of you people that are here and stuff. So I'm back to my brother. When the fire took out all the businesses, uh, most of the family, you know, my my uncle, my grandfather. There, my uh, aunt, all lost businesses. It was devastating. It was uh, my father's shoe store. He, you know, all the machines running, the leather, the smell of the leather. And I remember going in there. The leather was always. I like the smell of the he leather. Actually made shoes or repaired? repaired shoes. Sold shoes, sold and shoes repair. and repair. But uh, the big equipment he had, the big uh, long machines, you know, that they ran to do the cobbler shoes. And uh, but it was a devastating fire. They all regrouped and opened other businesses in different places and uh, rebuilt. It, it, was, it was interesting. It was all good. Now, one more story with Uncle Barney. He was a character. He would uh, talk about how he got trained to be uh, to shave, you know, with a straight edge. And my grandfather would have him put him a, a dime on his hand right here. And he, other hand. Okay. Oh, you'd be the hand, yeah. Right there. <laughs> and he would have to shave a guy without the dime falling off his hand, just to, just to make sure he had a steady hand. And uh, that's how you did it back then. You didn't go to school so much. You could apprentice under a barber. I had the honor of being the first haircut that my brother gave at the state. You know, when he was taking his board test. Now, i got to tell you this really quick story. I was only 16. I had three whiskers. And he had to give me a shave. And all the way down to Utica, he told me, now look, at, I'm going to shave you, and if I cut you, don't move. Don't move. If you see blood dripping down, don't move, don't make sound. I'm going to put some of this stuff on there. It might sting a little bit. Holy crap, talk about sting. I thought I would got hit by 5,000 bees. He's over here dabbing me all over, and I... And he passed, though. How did he pass? <laughs> On my blood, he passed a set. But on the other hand, he never he, he, but Uncle Bernie, I mean, these guys knew how to straight razor right shave. I'll never forget this, too, because he was shaving a guy one time, Saturday morning, I believe it was. He'd fall asleep. You know, you, you lay back there with the hot towels and did the shave, and the guy all of a sudden, he was just, I was, fall asleep. He probably went out Friday night, I don't know, whatever, but he was getting shaved. Fell asleep. Uncle Bernie put the tools down, went across the street to the icicle restaurant, got a cup of coffee, came back. He was still sleeping, shaving him. <laughs> got his money, and away he went. <laughs> he cut a guy's hair one time, never cut a hair out of his head. Yes, he That's when the hair got longer, and the guy came in all ruffled up, and he just kind of straightened it up and stood behind him and clip, clip, clip. There's already hair on the floor. Made the sound, charged the guy two bucks, and away he went. <laughs> Never cut a hair out of his head. Yeah, and he was happy. Yeah. Uh, 
and now I gotta go to my father a little bit because for years and years and I'm I'm done with my father right now because it's <laughs> no, no, uh, uh, it just a short one that he was involved with the, the new school up on the, the hill there and he was like the head custodian for years and years and years and up there and he just loved it and loved the kids and loved the families up there. So I just wanted to throw my dad in there a little bit more and uh that was after you yeah. yeah, after he was the shoe guy and all that stuff. That's where he uh, put in a lot of years up there. And he never did catch me smoking in the boys' room. <laughs> now, I have only one question of these guys. Did you notice which one of these guys is not clean shaven? <laughs> yeah, the barber. Got, the barber. I got sick of shame. <laughs> <laughs> that was great, guys. Thank you so much. Yeah, sure. Well, you know, what we have found going around town to town is um, the story of the fire burning the downtown is sadly repeated time and time again across the North Country because of the wooden structures everywhere. And what a devastation for the sort of centers of these communities that were relied on retail businesses like the Barnway family businesses. Um, it's kind of a sad story. At our ncpr.org slash work site, we have, um, we have, you can, you can find what we call North Country Burning. Is that right, Amy? North Did Country it, on Fire. North Country on Fire. And sadly, but very compellingly, we have photographs of many downtowns, with fire, including Canton, when the, uh, the old post office burned. Okay, up next. You ready? Liz Bodden? Did I say your name right? Liz, you're up. Welcome, Liz. Did I do that right? I might have brought you. Wait, I. I it's supposed to be Anne Root, actually. I'm sorry. Let's. You know, you put you put the station manager in charge, and everything falls apart. Is Anne here? Yeah. Oh, come on up, Anne. story is a little different. Um, I grew up with the mantra, the Cuthberts have always had sheep. Anybody <laughs> who knew my family, there was always sheep. You wanted to find my dad? Go to the place with the sheep, that's where my dad was. And sheep came from Scotland with the family, according to the lore. Um, and um, they presented a lot of opportunities over the years some tragedy over the years. Um, my dad had great opportunities. He had his first sheep were some horn dorset sheep. Little guys, because back then all the sheep were low. <laughs> Used to kid with the city cousins about how horrible it was delivering these lambs with these horns. It just was horrible. <laughs> <laughs> and people believed him. It was like, okay, dad, whatever. Sorry. I just want to get you a little closer. Okay, better? Speak a little closer. Okay. Anyway, so that was his thing again, one of the many things he did to his city cousins. Um, he would get to go to State Fair, he went to Syracuse. Back in those days, they would load any animals that were going to State Fair with 4-H onto a train. They would go down on a train. State Fair would supply feed. They would supply bedding. They would supply anything that you needed, and they put you up in a dorm. Nowadays, it doesn't work that way, but it kind of got him out of Hammond and, and out into the bigger world. Um, the tragedy part was when my dad, my granddad is 52, it was the day before Easter and he was shearing sheep at what's now called Cuthbert Farms. And he didn't come home and they went and they found him and he had had a massive stroke and he died the next morning. Um, and for a wonder, the Cuthberts still had sheep. They didn't get rid of them. It was amazing. And not only my family, but my Uncle Ben had Shropshire sheep. 
surprise Shropshire sheep. The op part of the opportunity that he provided was that he brought families into the area to take care of his sheep. Um, Ed Buchanan, I don't know if some people here remember Ed, I know. Yeah. He came over from Canada and got married, eventually bought a farm, raised his family over in Briar Hill because Uncle Ben hired him to take care of his sheep. Uh, George and Margaret Stewart came from Scotland the same way. Uncle Ben brought them over to take care of the sheep, and they built a life here because of the sheep. Um, and Ed was the second dad to my father after his father died, and they had some adventures. Um, one adventure was that Uncle Ben's sheep were going to the Chicago International on a train. And so Ed and Dad went, you went in the train car with your sheep. Well, they didn't have heat in there. It was pretty cold. And they were stopped at a crossing. They were moving the train cars around. And Uncle Herb, Ed saw this guy, you know, it was Ernie Mumford. He had heat and food and you name it. It was a great train place he had. So they went in there to get warm. Now, my dad's 15, okay? Ernie was quite the guy. He always had a few ladies around. And he pulls this lady down onto his lap. And she's, now, Ernie, you be careful. You know I don't wear any panties. <laughs> and here's my dad. His eyes are this big. He's like, oh, my. What have I gotten myself into? So he made it back from Chicago. They survived the trip. And he got to go to Chicago again, another opportunity. When he graduated high school, he was part of the St. Lawrence County Livestock Judging Team, okay? And the St. Lawrence County team that year won the New York State Livestock Judging. They went to Chicago. Lo and behold, they placed first at the Chicago International Livestock Show. Yep, yeah, it, was, it, was, it was quite the deal. Dad placed top in giving reasons. He used to teach here. I don't know how many, how few people here sat through his judging things. You know, you don't say something's better, you say how it is. But <clears throat> he was going to Cornell at the time. When he was down in Cornell to start with, he was just another person. Nobody really knew him. He's a kid from Hammond. He came back after this trip. And lo and behold, his reasons were perfect. His Everything was perfect. It was wonderful. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, he didn't get to finish at Cornell. He came home, bought a farm, bought some Hampshire sheep, blackface, blackface, nice, nice sheep. And he met a nice young lady from the Bronx and married her. The Cuthberts always have sheep. Uncle Ben, his gift to my mother when they got married was sheep. <laughs> Shropshire sheep. And it continued on. Um, my brother and I, he had Hampshire's, I had Shropshire's. We showed all over, met a lot of great people. Same thing with my daughter. She had Dorset sheep, and she just loved them. And we went on and on. And unfortunately, my dad had a stroke and died when my daughter was 15. And there were a mess of sheep, and there was just way too many for us to take care of. So we gave some to 4-H kids, and we sold some. We kept my daughter's sheep. Well, by the time it was time for her to go to college, it's like I am not working full time and take care of the sheep and do whatever I can. So I hold the um, person who sold the last sheep of the Cuthbert. But I remember all the, all the opportunities and all the fun times. The sad thing is I look at my granddaughters they're five and two and a half, and I wonder if they will ever have the same opportunities. Oh. But the Cuthberts always had sheep. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. <clears throat> um, we're going to pivot a little bit here little different style to telling about work and life in Hammond from, uh, I'm going to do this right this time, I'm going to get the right person, from um, Liz Scarlett. <coughs> Liz, there you are. Uh, come on up, Liz. 
Liz is going to talk about, I hope a little bit about having been a teacher in this area, but also a lot about her late husband, John Scarlett. One big living room, and you are people I've invited over. Right. <laughs> and I, I was told when I got here that the people, the brothers and the partners, got more time than the individuals. So I have multiple personalities, and I'm going to get as much time. <laughs> I also think I should have come after the Levarne Way boys because I've got a lot of hair in my story. <laughs> All right, this, when I agreed to do this, I said I want to have it be a tribute to John, my husband, John Scarlett, who died last year. It'll be a year in September. So I wanted it to be a tribute to him. And if he'd been alive, Somebody said it. He would have been all over this. He would have organized us. He would have broken us up into groups. And <laughs> so anyway, so here I am. Um, so John and I moved to the Rossi Hammond area in 1971. And we were back to the landers, hippies, homesteaders, whatever people wanted to call us. And hair was definitely a factor. Um, <laughs> John wrote a haiku poem, in fact, before we moved here, and the poem is Just Me. Sneakers, beads, and beard. I pass Lady Shopper, who must smell some bad fish. <laughs> so that's what we were dealing with when we moved here. And uh, I'd like David Duff to stand up, please, because a lot of the men look like David Duff. <laughs> And David, David is just about the last stand, uh, because Frank Peters, would you stand up, please? <laughs> he used to have a lot of hair and a beard. <laughs> Some of it not yeah. and, I, and I have the low beads. That was part of it, too, right. still. So the next part of this is, would people who consider themselves back to the land, homesteaders, hippies, would you raise your hand? Yeah. All right, good. I'm a good company. All right, so we moved here in 1971, and we, we just, we didn't know really what we were doing. Um, John did know before we moved that he wanted to have oxen, and he did a lot of research on it. He, he, he knew he didn't want to have a tractor, and he knew he didn't want to have horses because they were too difficult for him to manage. So we started doing research on oxen, and an ox, he found out, is a castrated bull, and then who becomes a steer, and then the steer is yoked and trained, and he thought that was something he could handle. So he did more research, he found out that we could go to Vermont, Tunbridge, Vermont, and we came back with two beautiful Durham steer, and they were oxen. And so this was in, started in 71, and by 1973, he wrote an article to Mother Earth News on oxen. He was now the expert on oxen. <laughs> and Frank Peters read the article, wrote to Mother Earth News, wanted to know John's address. Mother Earth News sent it to John, the letter. And we met Frank Peters. He stayed with us for a while. And he was, he's still here today. So that's a really cool part. So that was John. He became the expert so quickly. <clears throat> So, how did we use the oxen? There's so much to tell, it's really frustrating. Um, so, the oxen, so we had to earn enough money to live this lifestyle. So, with the oxen, uh, we made maple syrup, so the oxen pulled the sap. Lots and lots of logging, pulling the logs out of the, out of the woods, and sometimes being sold for firewood, sometimes being used for firewood, and sometimes using the wood to build the buildings. The oxen were involved in mowing and haying because we had to have the hay to feed them. So they played such an integral part of our lifestyle. We gave ox cart rides at craft fairs to help raise money. We met Ken Schwartz in Sackett's Harbor. He was a teenager and Ken Schwartz became a blacksmith at Williamsburg and he taught John blacksmithing and John became an artist blacksmith. And we have a blacksmith sitting right here. <laughs> and John, John did become a, an artist blacksmith. It was, pre, it was pretty amazing. We also 
this is really hard to believe now when I look back on it, we would go Christmas caroling with the oxen in Rossi. They would pull a wagon or a sled, depending on how snowy it was, and it was so cold, and, and oh, I can't believe we did it now. <laughs> we did it with we Yes, and people, but it was wonderful because we'd go up and down South Hammond Road, we'd go up, uh, uh, um, I can't think of it now, <laughs> Butler Road, and people would open the door and they'd, you know. So that was one of the, the bridges of getting us more accepted in the community. But the real bridge was worth work ethic. When they found out that we were workers and we had integrity, that definitely made a difference. And I love to tell the story. Just be, the three years before John died, he wanted to move the blacksmith building from the Burns Farm. And with Donnie Green's help, in fact, many, Liz Bodden did it, and her husband, so many people pulled together to make this happen, and it was Hammond, Rossi doing it together. So I already, I got the signal. So I'm gonna finish to help you appreciate what a wonderful poet he was. This is called Oxen, and it's after Wendell Berry. When I was, it's hard to see. When I was, excuse me. <clears throat> when I, at 28, came here, leaving the city forever, the farms were worked with tractors, though the farm, I later learned, was always worked with horses, and judging from shoes on earth by shovel and plow, oxen too. Oxen came first, after we'd killed and driven out the Iroquois, needing little uncumbered cumbered by stumps and ledges. The forest logged off, open to fields, the fields to grain, wheeled implements and horses, three rut dirt roads made possible rides to town and neighbors when mud and snow allowed. Oxen came to serve only their second purpose. Yokes hung over garage doors that opened onto all-weather roads, a world consumed by car, truck, and tractor. Hard scrambled farms, midwifed by oxen, were abandoned, born again as brush and trees. The deer returned along with beaver, turkey, coyote, vulture, went back to the Indians, old timers said. Back, how we hate to retreat, to treat again. Better perhaps knowing now where roads can take us and which ones to avoid. I came to a yoke, a pair of Durnham steers, red with new moon horns, beautiful, tractable and calm, when drawing plow and mower, or with arching shoulders, green logs through mud and snow. I walked beside them, leaning and talking, excuse, yes, and talking, the reins in my teeth, an ox team, ex, team masters like to say, the curse and lash tiring us all, going to the limit, no more possible. So yay, John Scarlett. <laughs> I can feel John here right now. And he'd be checking out the tools. Yes, he would. <laughs> um, yeah, I just got to take a minute there. John meant a lot to a lot of us. Um, okay. Moving right along, now the famous Liz Bowden. <laughs> other Liz. No, that, <laughs> well, you were, you were here first. Well, I was another one of those Massachusetts suburban kids that always wanted to farm. I remember my father saying, do you have any idea how hard your grandparents worked to get off of the farm? <laughs> but here I am. I've lived in a lot of places over, over uh, the course of my life, I guess, I, uh, I did manage to buy my own little 50-acre farm. I had goats and sheep, lots of poultry. I thought it was important that I outweigh an animal that was on my farm. <laughs> <laughs> so then I met my husband, and uh, he's a third-generation dairy farmer. I became a dairy farmer when I married one. And we moved here to Hammond in 1999 to what everybody called the Hofferberth Farm. Um, and I had to call it the Hofferberth Farm so that everyone would know where I lived for apparently up until about a year ago. <laughs> because that was when I said, I was describing where I lived to yet another. I said, 
it's what it's where Bob Hoffer birth used the Hoffer birth farm, and they looked at me with a blank look, and I went, "Wow, okay, so 19 years is how long it takes <laughs> until somebody is people are going to call it the Baden farm, like in another 20 years, probably." <laughs> so. I wanted to tell you just this uh, cool story because things there's so many things that happen on a farm and every time something happens, you learn something. And I learned a lot this one day. Um, it was where we were first starting to cut hay. So this was about 2003 or four or something like that. My son Nathan, you probably a lot of you know him. He's 22 now, up to here, and he was about he was about in kindergarten at that time. And it had been a tough spring. Uh, in South Hammond, we have that terrifically heavy clay that's nice and shallow over the rock. <laughs> uh, so when we get a really wet spring, it's a, it's a long wait till we can get on the fields. So this was, uh, you know, we had waited a long time, and it was into June, and we were trying to get the first cut hay done. So it was a pretty busy day. Uh, after chores and milking in the morning, my husband hooked on to the haybine and he went down the road to uh, Jim Tague's field and he was going to cut that. I got the round baler ready. There was guys there putting a new roof on our house. We were really stepping up. It was going to fix the holes in the roof. It would no longer snow on my bed. I was really psyched about this. <laughs> so, uh, it, and Nathan was in the tractor with me. So I had a Volta tractor with room behind the seat. We always called it a boy seat, but of course they don't call it that. It has to be at a training seat because you don't want to make it sound like people take their kids with them in the tractor. <laughs> and, and what mother doesn't? So we had a water bottle, we had snacks, we had a pillow for the boy seat. We were set. So we were just going next to the house. There's a heifer pasture. Just beyond that is the hay field. And it had been mowed when it was literally standing water. There was water everywhere. But magically, when you let that sun down to the ground, it dries up and the hay was perfectly dry and beautiful. Now the baler had been driving, acting up a little bit. I told Brian it was driving hard. I didn't know how to describe it any other way than that. And so that morning he spent some time looking over it. I said, you know, it took out a shear pin and I didn't plug it. So I don't know why that is. Um, so he climbed all over it, he greased everything that would take grease and oiled everything that needed oil, and he pronounced it good to go. I said, okay. So we head off to the field. And I'm doing the outside rounds, and it's still driving a little hard, but I really can't put my finger on it. Maybe I'm making this up anyways. It's fine. So Nathan's watching the hay going into the, the pickup. And that's kind of a mesmerizing thing. And then, so he enjoys watching the birds and the ones flying up out of the windrow. And then there's always a, a, a bunch of gulls that come around to get the poor, unsuspecting little uh, field voles that are uh, running away. So there's lots of stuff to watch. But he only lasts for the outside rounds, and then he's fast asleep. So I get to the up and down rows. And I don't really remember noticing anything before the smell of the smoke. <laughs> And so I'm in the cab. I figure, if I can smell smoke, this is really bad. So I turn around, and sure enough, on the top of the baler, I see some wisps of smoke. So I'm thinking, shut everything down. I can climb up the baler and take that offending wad of smoky hay off, because there's not really a fire. It's just a little smoke. So I can just grab that and pull it off. That's what I'm thinking. So I get down off the tractor after shutting everything off, climb up over the front of the, of the baler, and it's all the way at the top. I am surprised. I can't reach that far. <laughs> I'm, I'm getting up as high as I can, can't reach it. Okay, plan B. All right, there's a water bottle. <laughs> and <laughs> so I run back into the cab, get the water bottle. It's a little Pepsi bottle like this. So I climb back up on the front of the, the, uh, the, front of the baler again, and there I am just kind of like throwing the, <laughs> the water <laughs> from the Pepsi bottle. There's little flames appearing now. Uh, so now... <laughs> So now I'm beginning to panic. So I'm looking around. And I go, okay, the whole field was underwater when we cut this. I'm looking around for puddles to, to, you know, for my water supply because it's empty now. And there was no puddles anywhere. The flames now are bigger. And I look up in the, in, in the tractor, and my son's still asleep. He's totally ob oblivious to the whole thing. Somewhere I had read a long time ago about uh, tractors catching on fire fast because it runs up the hydraulic lines. 
So I think I said this out loud. You may take this bailer, but you're not going to get the new tractor. <laughs> so, so I go into unhooking the bailer mode, which I'm not sure why this led to a, a sense of calm. So I just un we unhook the bailer. We always unhook the bailer the same way. So it's like, so I grab the jack and I put the jack down. <laughs> My husband and I said later on, why did you do that? Why did you do that? Because we're unhooking. So I un put the jack down and take the pin out. And then I try to go take the PTO. Well, the PTO shaft has one of those little knobs on the side, and you've got to have the strength of King Kong to get it. It was always a sticky thing. I never could get it. I said, that's it. I'm just driving away. As it turned out, that's the only part of the bailer that I saved was half of the PTO shaft that was still stuck to the tractor. <laughs> so... My plan at this point was, okay, um, I get back to the house because there's a fire extinguisher in the kitchen because I can zip to the house because it's right next to the field, you know, and, uh, and come back and put the fire up. That's my plan. So I hop in the tractor and I'm driving in road gear across, diagonally across the field to get back on the road. So I have awakened the sleeping one at this point. So I hear, you know, and all of a sudden he's grabbing the seat. Mom, what the heck? I said, shut up, the bail is on fire. <laughs> and he just says, oh. <laughs> he's a farm boy. He knows this is, you know, he knows what this means. So we pull in the driveway. The, uh, ran in the kitchen. I look out the kitchen window, which faces that field now, and the tires are now involved. Oh. So big, huge flames, giant amount of black smoke. I don't need to be bringing the fire extinguisher now, so, so I call the fire department. Hi, well, my bailer's on fire. You know, do what you can. And then I went back out into the driveway. By this time, the guys are down off the roof, and the neighbors begin to arrive. So Troy Arquette and Doc Young shows up on a, on a four-wheeler with big, broad smiles. They say, hi, hey, we saw your smoke signals. <laughs> so I'm standing there feeling like, you know, pretty, uh, pretty hopeless. And I said to uh, Norris Hanshu, who was uh, leading the crew of guys up on the roof, I said, Norris, I don't know how I'm going to tell Brian I just burnt up the new round baler. And Norris was looking over my shoulder in the other direction. I said, I'm pretty sure, she says, uh, I don't think you're going to have to tell him. I'm pretty sure he's figured it out. And I turned around behind me, and there he is coming up the road on the, on the Ford, wound right out as fast as she'll go up the road. And he pulls in. By this time, the fire department arrives. They're mostly all my neighbors, you know? So it's like Brad Bertram and Max Millsap and Mike Fuller and, and Danny Bickelhoff. And, uh, you know, and they look at it, and they go, well... We can't drive this fire truck in the field because <coughs> that ground is too soft. It's not an all-terrain vehicle. And we said, oh, okay then. Oh, he says, no, 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 you don't understand. There's rules. When you call the fire department, we have to put the fire out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so what you're saying is you can't bring the fire truck to the burning baler, so we have to bring the burning baler that's still on fire to you. Yeah, pretty much that was it. <laughs> so, uh, so Brian unhooks, uh, hooks from, unhooks the loader tractor from the disc spine. He runs and goes and gets a big chain. And he and Doc Young, you know, kind of <laughs> kind of <laughs> hook it around, the <laughs> lasso it around the tongue of the round baler. And this is where he begins cursing me because I was the one to put the jack down. Because had I not put the jack down, there wouldn't be this little spiky thing sticking down that they had to inch and bounce across the field. They would have just been able to, like, pull it. But there you go. Once again, another thing that's my fault. So, <laughs> so uh, they did get it out. They did get the tailgate of the baler up and uh, the small bale it was inside out, and they hosed everything down, including the inside of the baler. And, uh, and they left. And we called Bob Stein, our insurance agent, because what else do you do? And we were pretty courteous to the neighborhood. We left the burnt out baler right next to the road for, for the neighbors, you know, for the weekend. Because <laughs> everybody's got to go see, you know. Uh, so when things like this happen, you learn, you learn a lot. And I learned three things. 
I learned to always carry a fire extinguisher in the tractor. And I learned to never buy a piece of equipment that has sealed bearings on it where you can't grease them. And the third thing that I learned was, it's really interesting how fame and notoriety kind of works in the countryside. <laughs> so two weeks later, I'm in the school picking Nathan up from school, and this blonde little girl and her two friends come running up to me in the, in the hallway saying, you're that lady that burnt the mailer. <laughs> that was me. Uh, we've kind of all been there in one way or another. I, I have a fire slash back to the lander slash hippie story. About a year after I moved to the Maple Ridge Road, I live in Old Cab and I'm on the same farm since 1971. Um, we had a chimney fire. It was one of those old half chimneys that basically kind of were used to hooked up to your cook stove and then the chimney was in the second floor and out the roof. And I knew nothing about chimneys. I grew up on the 18th floor of an apartment building in Manhattan. I was one year in the country, and we had a chimney fire. So we called the volunteer fire department. I had that much sense, at least. And we actually managed to get the fire out by the time they got there. But we were the new hippies in the neighborhood, basically. We were the first people to live on that road who came from more than three miles away. And we were literally from Mars. And everybody wanted to see the inside of my house. So the cars from the volunteer fire department were lined for half a mile in either direction. And I probably had 50 guys come tromping through the house. And it was great. I got to meet a lot of people that way. <laughs> and the house didn't burn down. Any case. Next, we have. Oh, no. David Duff and Frank Peters. Bring it on, guys. I have, I have no idea what they're going to talk about. But I'm just going to say, only b believe no more than 50% of it. <laughs> well, this is Seth Jones. <laughs> you might want to pull it out of there so you can hold it close to your mouth. There you go. These are hard acts That's to follow. I'm, yes, I'm Frank Peters. This is <laughs> Like this? Yeah. <laughs> I can't think with it up there, Frank. <laughs> uh, I came here with two years of school teaching experience, one summer of garden work, about six summers of asphalt raking, and a couple of summers of working on a curb and gutter crew with concrete. And I decided that this movement back to the land, because my father's family were farmers in Eastern Oregon, was a perfect fit for me. That I had all of the skills necessary, and this was gonna be a slam dunk. What sealed it was getting picked up by a Lutheran minister, I was hitchhiking here after Nixon's second inauguration, and he picked me up. Um, 81 had been closed because there was a sleet storm, and he had a Volkswagen with five kids in it, and he made room for me. And I told him I was up here looking for property, and I planned to camp out. I had a backpack and a whole bunch of stuff, and I'd never camped out, but how hard can it be to just stay outside? <laughs> Well, he listened, and, and the kids listened. They were coming back from a retreat. And they said, well, we're going we're gonna to stop in uh, Theresa, and um, why don't you come on in and have dinner with us, and we'll sort out you know, where you're gonna, what barn you're going to sleep in. Well, I ended up staying in Theresa on that couch for a week. And meanwhile, they handed me off to various relatives who might know about property for sale in the region. And it was at that time that Brother Bruce, the Lutheran minister, said, you know, you, you ought to read this article in the paper about this couple up in Rossi, uh, John Scarlett and his wife Liz, because I think they're doing what you are interested in doing. So move ahead quickly. 
I, I, I found a farm, and then I found John and Liz, and then I found out about Oxen and Frank Peters, and I decided, look, if, if those two have Oxen, I, I can't miss, right? So I gotta have Oxen. So you don't just generally go out and buy Oxen. It, it takes four years to get them to a point where, where you, they're handy. Um, John gave me an article that he wrote, and, and the beginning of it, and it's about oxen, how you, I just imagine, man, if there had been Facebook and all that stuff, John would have been around the world. Just, But he started out the article with Liz and I decided to hitch our fortune to a star. And that always intrigued me, because what John introduced to me was, there is no wrong way to do it. It's your way. And that gave me confidence to try things like, you know, reinvent the wheel. Hell, you got to work at that one, and then you finally understand why maybe I don't necessarily need to do that. But in that whole process, you learn a whole bunch of other things. Frank and I and John worked together on many different jobs. One of the experiences that's a favorite of mine uh, if, if we were cutting logs, we would buy logs from the state off of state land. You could get it for a pittance, and all you had to do was put all your labor into it and get it out the roadside, and then you had to find a trucker who pick it up and take it to a sawmill. Just three things to do. <laughs> and we were focusing on just getting it to the roadside, and I don't think the other two things had occurred to us. But at any rate, this brought us into contact with Ben Shepard who had the closest sawmill in the Poister. And one Sunday, we were working across the road on state land, cutting cedar fence posts, because you could buy them 10 cents post. On the hook, as they say. You've got to cut them and drag them out and all this stuff. And so Frank and I, John, were there. And we looked across the road, and there were all these little faces in the window. And then pretty soon, John Ben Shetler comes up. Now, Ben Shetler's an Amish fellow who had first sawmill on coming with 10. And Ben comes out, and we're not really clear what's going to happen next, you know, because it's a Sabbath, and we're working, and he starts out with something about, you know, for six days I'm going to rip and tear, and the seventh day I shall repair, and we kind of nervous laughter, didn't know really where this conversation was going. So we talked a little bit, and then Ben said, you know, we speak German in the home, and we have trouble sometimes with the English language. Um, could you help us, like, if you say the phrase, an egg yolk is white, or an egg yolk are white? How, how do you say that in English? Well, oh, John and Frank and I looked at one another. I think I was the spokesman, and so, well, it is white. I think it's yellow. <laughs> Epiphany. <laughs> this guy is so much further ahead than we are. <laughs> We're just beginning to realize we need to catch up. <laughs> and that was kind of our introduction to the sawmill and how we thought we were going to turn it out. Um, at that point in our lives, we had an inexhaustible source of energy. We worked in a woodlot in Ross Sea, the, the spring of the Three Mile Island meltdown. Frank was, I think, literally living in the woods at that time. We built a cabin for me. And there were... I was exiled. <laughs> changed the locks on the door. Yep, yep. Um, and at one point, John said, I think I need to take tomorrow off. Liz told me it's Mother's Day, and we've been working 28 days straight. When you're so involved in something that is just, um, it's like a song, it's joyous. I had no concept of how long we'd been in there, and it, it just, I guess the gist of what I'm trying to tell you what we were doing was we were working, but it was joyful, and when you work like that with one another, it's not really work, it's fun. 
and we had fun. That was Marsalls with that. And it was Elm for a barn over the cloister. Mm -hmm. And we were we were having a good time. The oxen were, it was in the springtime, and the oxen were just mowing down the leaves. And every time they went by you, either the front of them or the back of them smelled like leaves. <laughs> and so we're skidding out logs and we're having a good time. We're felling trees and it's fun where, you know, I can fell a tree better than you can, or I can put the tree right there. Oh, no, you can't. And we, you know, just stupid competitions. So we're skidding the logs out, and David Duff goes by me with his team with the log. And he's up on the log, which you're not supposed to do while it's moving. So I said to David, just be careful, you, you can fall off of that. And he said, oh no, and he's riding it like this. Oh no, I'm not gonna fall off of that. And the oxen hit a rock, the log went like this, David Duff goes flying, and boom, back on the log he goes, quick as a cat. <laughs> and I went over to him and said, Dumb as an ox. <laughs> so, David and, and I worked in the woods together a lot. John would work with us periodically, but we had a, we had a good time, and David and I worked hard. One of us didn't do more than the other, mostly. <laughs> um, but we got along really well in the woods. We threw, threw snowballs at each other while they were over in the woods trying to do something that we weren't supposed to be looking at. But we, we knew what they were doing. We would throw snowballs at each other. <laughs> and um, we, had, we had a good time. We worked hard. And I think that was one of the one of the things that um, you and I both grew up with, uh, someone teaching us a work ethic. I went to a boys' school in Hershey, Pennsylvania, where you worked every day. You, you didn't get days off. I mean, you went to, went to church on Sunday, but then when you came back, you got, you got to work again. And in ninth grade, I was, you would decide whether you want to go into uh, college prep classes or whether you wanted to do a vocational class. So I decided I wanted to um, major in agriculture. And then you had, you had a lot of choices where you could, you could go work in uh, a slaughterhouse, a creamery, um, uh, farm machinery. Uh, you could work at, at the golf course. You had all kinds of opportunities. So of course I picked the slaughterhouse. My first day at the slaughterhouse, I was in ninth grade, I weighed about 110 pounds, and there were five of us who were going to start at the slaughterhouse for this class. And you would work two weeks in the slaughterhouse, and then you had two weeks of classroom. Well, they said, Jim Harvey, you go you know, to the, to the uh, uh, cutting room. Um, Danny Wellman, you go here, and you know, five of us. I, We'll cut this short. Um, and I was the last one in line, the scroniest one of the group. And I went with this guy named Jigsy, and we went down in the blood pit that had just been emptied, and we cleaned it. And I thought I was going to die. I came out of the blood pit, and I said to Jigsy, what can I do to never do that job? <laughs> and he said, whatever they ask you to do, do it really well, and you'll, and you'll move up. <laughs> so hearing uh, Ben Shetler's name mentioned, <clears throat> Ben also was a harness maker, and um, I had horses for many years, raised Percherons, and Ben was our, our harness maker. My most ex remarkable moment in his shop was he had a photograph that he was showing everyone for many, many years. 
because he had been commissioned by the Canadian government to build a harness, a 40 horse harness, 40, 40 horse harness because the Queen was coming to Canada and there was a, this, and there was the photograph of the 40 horse hitch in, in Ottawa and he was so proud of that, it was such an amazing, did you ever see that photograph? It's just really remarkable. Okay, onward. This could go on all night, right? Okay, we need a campfire next, and, right? Uh, there, there are two stories left, and um, the next one comes from Pam, Pam Winchester. Oh, you're right here. Am I close enough? I, I'm going to take you back a little bit because this isn't a story that I went through. It was a story that was told to me uh, by a woman who was 91 years old. Her name was Catherine Demick Nearing. And, and she, she was just a hoot. And I, I was related to her, but um, she was my mom's cousin. And she had a great love of automobiles. And this was one of the first stories that happened to her. She was a plumber's. Uh, daughter when she was a teenager and this is the story when she was a teenager and she was learning her her father's respect uh, Her father's name was Frank Demick and he owned a uh, plumbing store in the village for many many years until the big fire and um, He one day he was he had sold a big claw foot cast iron um, bathtub and he had loaded it up on his flatbed truck um, in the 1930s. So uh, he was all set to bring it over to Governor. The customer was over in Governor and um, he was going to deliver it to the plumbing store in Governor. And Katie was able to go with him because she was, um, it, it was summertime and she was going to be able to go. So she was very excited when all of a sudden they heard this rapping on the door. Frank, Frank, are you in there? Frank, I need your help. Well, Frank, Frank was her father, and, her, and she and her father ran to the door to see what was going on. Frank, you won't believe it. Frank, come and help me. So they found his, their, his neighbor, um, their neighbor Ned, and he had a, a plumbing issue at his house, and his wife was fit to be tied because there was company coming. So, so Frank, he asked, Frank, Frank, please, will you come help me? And Frank is saying, well, I can't. I have to deliver this tub to Governor and I won't, uh, I won't be back until dark. And Frank is, uh, so he's saying, I know you're in a tight spot because when company comes in the 1930s, you can't call them up on the cell phone and say, sorry, we're, you know, something's happened. So, these, so this Aunt Mabel had come and was on her way to uh, Ned's house and Ned was, was kind of scared that the toilet was having malfunction. Um, so, he did, Ned, uh, Frank was saying, I, geez, I, I'd really like to help you, Ned, but I don't know who could drive the truck. You know, it's all packed and ready to go, but it's such a late moment. It's got to get out right away to go to Governor or will he be late? And all of a sudden you hear Katie, my, um, the woman telling the story, I'll go, I'll go, Daddy, I can drive the truck. Well, Katie's about not quite 16 yet. And it's one of those big, huge, flatbed trucks with the clutch and all that. And um, she had driven a couple times with her father around through town delivering some things. So she had some experience. But in the 1930s, men had their jobs and women had their jobs. And to have a young girl driving this truck to the plumbing store was not really appropriate. So Katie's father had to be thinking very hard about the decision of should he actually go help his neighbor Ned or should he go and let Katie drive the truck to the plumbing store even though he might get hassled a little bit about letting a young girl drive this truck. And um, to Katie's excitement, he decided, I'm gonna trust my daughter. She's gonna be good, she's a good driver and she's gonna take the truck with the tub, 225 pounds of it, cast iron is pretty heavy, over to Governor. Now, Katie was telling the story, and she's like, I can't remember what route I went, to, but I do remember this steep, steep hill. And if you're from Hammond, you know Marvin Hill. Marvin Hill is a hill that's one of the steeper hills in Hammond. 
And one of the rites of passage as a, a young driver was to go up on Marvin Hill and stop the truck and then try to let the clutch out without stalling. And if you could do that, you would be a pretty good driver. Well, Katie had surpassed that, and she was, she was good. But this hill was really steep, steeper than Marvin Hill and much longer. And she realized, oh, man, I'm going to have to, I'm, my, this truck is so heavy, I'm just going to die in the middle there, and then I'm going to have to do this clutch thing, and I better start gaining some speed before I get to it. So as she's approaching the hill, she starts putting on a little bit of gas on there, but apparently a little too much gas, because suddenly, shh, she feels something funny. Uh -oh. The tub is starting to slide down the back of the flatbed to, come, to fall off. Nobody had secured it with any kind of ties, thinking the 225 pounds would be keeping it on the truck. So she's, she's thinking, she's going up, up, up. The, sh the tub is sliding, sliding, sliding. She's like, oh, I gotta think quick. Think, think, think. I got it. <laughs> she puts her foot on the brake, slams the brakes on, and the tub goes sliding back up towards the cab. <laughs> Woo! I, I told Katie, you're so clever. I would never have thought of that. That's genius. And she's smiling. She's 91, you know, and she's just like, yeah. I knew what I was doing then. And then she goes, but that wasn't the only hurdle I had that day. The second hurdle came when she got to the plumbing store. So un, unbeknownst to her, her father had, well, um, these, the manager of the store had tell, told all his pals that this young teenage girl was going to come and arrive with this tub. And they were going to try to see if she could back the tub into the loading dock. Well, if anybody knows where the Governor Plumbing Store was, there was this big, the loading dock was back around the building, and you had to, like, make this U-turn type thing and then maneuver back, forth, back, forth, er, into the loading dock. So they thought they were going to get a kick at seeing this poor little tiny 15-year-old girl driving this big, huge, heavy truck to see if it could go in the loading dock. But surprise, surprise, as they're craning their neck around the corner, she drives right up, backs right in, right into the loading dock, right there. And they go, the jaws are dropping, and she thinks, the kid did it, the kid did it. I can't believe it. Frank was right, she can drive. And so she told me this story because it was, a, a, she really felt good about her father's respect and trust for her, and it was very, very important for her. And at, after that moment, it made a big, long-lasting impression because the man at the governor store had told her father, you wouldn't believe how expert she was at driving that. You, you should be really proud of your daughter. And so her father did tell her that, and she felt so good about his trust and respect, and he um, sort of broke a mold letting her drive the truck. So it was, it was a good story. It lasted, she told it, 75 years later. <laughs> it's amazing. I wanted to share it with you. The thing about being on the farm or being in the country that everyone knows is survival is based on your capacity to problem solve on your own, in a remote location, like the baler on fire. There's no help. You gotta deal with what you gotta deal with, and someone isn't gonna come and rescue you, and I think that's part of the resilience we all develop living here. Our final scheduled storyteller is Ev Thomas. Are you still here, Ev? Yes. On the air, we promoted this by talking about um, sturgeon fishing. And we are about to deliver on that promise. Come on up, Ed. Thank you. Well, I'd like to uh, introduce you to my grandfather, Harry Dake. Uh, unfortunately, Harry's not here anymore. Um, he actually hasn't been here since about 1974, when I spread his ashes on the St. Lawrence River. So I guess you could say maybe Harry's everywhere. Um, but I, I did put him in one of my favorite fishing spots. Uh, Harry was born in the uh, late 1800s, in the 1890s, in Hammond, actually at Oak Point. Uh, went to school here in Hammond and came back to the family farm uh, that had been going for all oh, some 50 years in Oak Point, uh, where Katie and I live now. Uh, I don't know, maybe sixth generation or so, something like that. And 
after, uh, after going to school, he returned to the farm for a while, but he did not want to be a farmer. His father was a truck gardener that supplied vegetables to the Oak Point community and other communities around there. Uh, later was to have a small dairy farm. Uh, the dairy barn that we have was built in 1893, and we still have it, so it's still, still standing. But he decided he wanted to do something else. And he became um, a steam fitter, and a plumber, and a metal worker. Um, those things that he learned both on the farm uh, and through his own experience. And he also became a carpenter. And in trying to take apart some of the things that he built, I realized that Harry would never use a 16-penny nail when a 20-penny nail could fit in that board. <laughs> uh, but that was, that was Harry Dake. And he did that for a while. But then, around 1940, the United States Coast Guard took um, control of the lights in the St. Lawrence River. And the Coast Guard was required to maintain these lights in the lighthouses. And Harry went to work for the Coast Guard as a, as a light keeper. In other words, he was responsible for keeping the lights lit because there wasn't any electricity there, and so you had to make sure that it had fuel and things going. So he became what was called a lamplighter. It was not a high-paid job. Uh, actually, through an act of Congress, it was established that a lamplighter would not be paid any more than $10.50 per month for each light. So it wasn't a very high-paying job, but it was something he did, and I know that he did it after the Coast Guard assumed that because we still have some of his his letterhead, uh, U.S. Coast Guard letterhead. But Harry didn't just work there, besides being a steam fitter and working still a little bit on the farm, he also became a sturgeon fisher. And sturgeon are a rather remarkable fish. They're, they're truly prehistoric in nature. A very, very long-lived fish. And we don't have very many of them left in the St. Lawrence River now, but back 50 and 70 years ago, there was a very good fishery of them. And they, they were fished with at night. Uh, sturgeon are bottom feeders. You don't catch them by trolling or by casting. You bait a hook and you put it about on the bottom. And several of them baited with just chunks of fish. And you would leave them and you would go back in the next morning to find out what you caught. Uh, Harry would bring the fish back that he caught. In a lot of cases, they were something around 100 pounds. And I would tell you that a 100 pound sturgeon back then was somewhere between 125 and 150 years old. Very, very slow growing fish. But he'd bring the fish back and put it in a crib that was made out of railroad ties. And we know that so well because my mother, Harry used to tell me about it, but also my mother, uh, when she was a young gal, used to go down there in the crib and kind of, you know, poke the fish and, walk and look at the fish because Harry wanted to keep them alive because once or twice a week the train would go from Hammond and eventually wind up in New York City. And that morning, Harry would get up early and dress the sturgeon out and drive it to the Hammond train station. And that evening, it would be in New York City. And I'm told in a lot of cases uh, that the sturgeon was smoked. I'd sold it in the New York City area. And so that provided something of a living for, uh, for Harry. Uh, so, you know, back in those days, it took a lot of different things in some ways to make a living. And here's Harry making a little bit of living on the farm, and he's also making um, a living being a sturgeon fisherman. He's also being a steam fitter, uh, tending lights, and uh, doing basically whatever it took to get by. He, they also provided a lot of the game for the farm, uh, and uh, that they, they would shoot. And he had a brother, uh, and uh, he and Roger had a little bit of a competition occasionally. You know, brothers occasionally do compete a bit. And uh, they were having a conversation one time about who was the best shot. And they were sitting on the porch. And Roger brought the subject up, and they had a spirited discussion. And Roger said, why? He says, you're no shot, Harry. He says, you see that rabbit out there? He says, I'll bet you can't shoot that rabbit. And Harry looked, he could see the rabbit pretty clearly. And he knew that was an easy shot. He said, why, heck, I can do that. He got a 22 and lined up and shot. The rabbit never moved. <clears throat> and Harry said a few words. Lined up again, shot again. Rabbit never moved. Harry said a few more words. And uh, Roger's just kind of smiling. I told you you couldn't shoot. 
Harry shot a third time, the rabbit didn't move, but he just knew something was wrong. So Harry got closer and closer and found out that rabbit was stone dead. <laughs> Rod had shot, shot it the day before and staked it out. Oh. All playing with it. So boys will be boys. But anyway, that's my story of Harry and uh, of uh, Harry Day. Thank you. So in a way, we've come full circle because um, that smoke sturgeon, when I was a kid growing up in New York City, on Sunday mornings, the delicacy big deal was breakfast, and when it include, included smoked sturgeon, that was like the best Sunday morning meal we could have. And it never occurred to me, until just now actually, that this was probably where it was coming from. <laughs> and maybe from Harry. <laughs> North Country at work, um, I kind of panicked because I wanted to make sure that John's poem was included. When it comes to work, I forgot to say that we were not able to make enough money doing what we did with oxen and logging and goats and pigs and vegetables and whatever. So somebody had to work off the farm, and that was decided between the people. It wasn't always the same. And I ended up working at Hammond School as a substitute, and then I went part-time, and then I became the full-time person. But it was different for different couples, like Mark and Louise Scarlett, John's brother and wife, they decided they would take turns. So for a while, one of them would work off the farm and then they would switch places. And another part of this was which job was more important. And so you would have to negotiate working off, is it more important, or being on the farm, is it more important. And the other thing that I noticed looking at pictures uh, from long ago on farms, it's mostly men doing work. Was that because it was more valued, or was that because the women were behind the cameras? I, I don't know, I don't have the answer to that. But I did notice for, I can only speak for us, but I tended to do the traditional things, like the canning and the gardening and the chickens, partly because I didn't have the strength and partly because I didn't want to. Um, but, and John always, with my prompting, always readily said, I can do what I can do because Liz is working out. I have a little poem to P.S. that with. Um, man must work from dusk to dawn, but a woman's work is never done. Amen. If you go to any Amish farm today, which pretty much parallels what small farm life was like for everyone around here, 75 to 100, 125 years ago. All I know is my buddy Lizzie, she's working from sun up until everyone else is asleep. And she is going full speed. And one of the things Amy and I decided early on in this project was we were going to work very, very hard to find stories and images that document the um, uncredited work of women, particularly in traditional agricultural settings. And we've actually, we consider that image of a woman feeding hens in the yard si tremendously significant. And if you go to ncpr.org slash work and type in the tag women, all the photographs we've gathered that feature women, women work, whether it's teaching, feeding hens, driving a tractor, you know, they are, women are most definitely represented, although his, in the history books, deeply, deeply underrepresented. That's my little speech for tonight. <laughs> Do we feel as if we have time if anyone who we didn't hear from tonight wants to share a short story with us? If there's anyone who, we're, we're a little bit after nine, but if you're moved. <laughs> I have, I'm a third-generation dairy farmer from the water company. Close enough. Step right up. Out of Blacksmith. In 19... Tell us your name. Michael Gracie. And in 1954, I 
my grandfather's new barn burden. But that was the first year of mutual aid in Jefferson County. And there were 34 fire companies there. And the only thing he lost was the roof. So the next morning they were milking in the barn again. And they added on to that barn. Um, it was a 200 foot barn. They added on 24 more feet. It was a 224 foot barn. It was the biggest barn in Jefferson County at the time. And I'm going to tell you a little story now. This, this is the fun part, the barn raisings. Now we're going back to a time when everybody got together for a barn raising. And they put all the rafters up in the morning before lunch, the whole length of the barn. And in the afternoon, they put up all the roof boards and started to put the tin on. Just people coming together. So are you a dairy farmer now? I retired from the dairy. I Four years ago I sold the cows. I didn't need them anymore. We had a grain business. Sold corn and soybeans. We sold grain for 30 years. And so I upgraded the grain business. and Help was hard to get, so I did what I could do. I didn't need two businesses. So you still run the grain business? Yes. And where is that exactly? It's on State Route 283. It's the old Pearl Street Road between New York Air Break and the old gate of Fort Drum. Mm -hmm. Great. And you're still blacksmithing? Well, I took that up t after the cows left because I never had time to do it when I had cows. So I had a forge for 30 years or more. And it sat in the corner of the shop. Finally, I got it out and used it. Great. wrap up the evening. Um, Big thanks for sure again thank to you for Donna. Coming. Everyone should come and eat some of these snacks. Eat snacks. Uh, yes. um, thank and you thank you all for coming. Yes. Would you have time for one short one? Sure. Come on up. Give us your name and where you live and all that good stuff. I'll give his name. <laughs> this is Dave Ellis. Alias? No. Um, <laughs> I just need to say something before I get on to other things here, or before I forget, because my memory is very bad. Why am I a historian? I don't know, because I have to write everything down instead of keeping it in my head. So anyway, but that's what some of the historians were like. They knew everything in their head, and some of them didn't write it down, and then we don't know where the information is. Anyway, just want to... Um, let you know if you don't already know, if you're on Facebook, we have a Hand and Memories group, and you can share more memories on there and read about the many memories that we have. You can get onto our website, HammondMuseum.com, or we have different names you can get under. But we also have a link that goes right to the NCPR um, work thing, ncpr.org slash work, there we go. So you can do it from our website as well. Okay, without further ado, I don't know what Dave's gonna say, but there he is. Thank you, Donna. Thank you, Owen, and the rest of the NCPR crew for coming out here. And, and uh, I know you guys, uh, your, your news team gets on the national NPR news a lot because of the North Country stuff that goes on, and that's pretty cool. I'm a product of a, uh, of two farming families, the Latant family from North Hammond and the Ellis family from Ogdensburg. My grandfather, George Ellis, had a large dairy on the outskirts of Ogdensburg, and my grandfather and grandmother, uh, Latant, had a small dairy with about 12 head over here on the Pleasant Valley Road. And the story I want to share is that uh, we'll go back to uh, corn time in 1927, so we're talking middle of uh, September, and uh, my grandmother had helped uh, feed all the men who came over to cut corn the previous day, and my grandfather at the end of the day said, boys, you're going to have to probably bring your lunch tomorrow, and they said, okay, we'll do that. 
And so they did that, and they asked uh, later on, they said, so Leon, how come we had to bring our lunch and your wife wasn't able to, to fix uh, our, our dinner for us? Uh, we're coming over here to help you. It's because uh, the reason was that my grandmother had uh, given birth to my mother the, that, that day, and she, she, uh, she, she, she had her work cut out for her. She had disguised it with an apron, and so my mother was born in the, the bedroom of the home where my wife and I live now. And uh, my family moved to Florida, though, and I had the misfortune of being raised in Fort Lauderdale, but the great fortune of spending summers up here in uh, St. Lawrence County, and especially on the uh, little farm there on Pleasant Valley Road. So this has been a neat event. I hope that you can do it again, and I know Don would love to have you come back here because uh, this is a, a neat museum and a situation that they've got going on here with the Scottish Festival a couple of weeks ago, and now this, and I hope it continues to grow. So thank you very much for your time. In other words, your grandmother was in labor. <laughs>